berührt sie miteinander. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to uh, welcome you to this open forum session. We're very happy to see so many of you here tonight. Of course, uh, uh, this is uh, due to our fantastic panel. And of course, it is also a matter of the topic that we will be dealing with uh, uh, during the next hour and a half. Uh, the secret is out, what's next for Switzerland? That's our topic tonight. I am Andrea Bleicher. I am uh, deputy chief editor of the Sonntagszeitung, a Swiss newspaper. And I will be the moderator of this program, of the panel discussion, rather. We're going to think about uh, various things uh, connected with what's next. Uh, there's no more banking secrecy in Switzerland. What's left in Switzerland? Uh, where do we have to go? Where do we want to go? How do we have to change? Do we have to change at all? Our panel discussion uh, participants uh, will try to answer this question. There are various solutions uh, that are possible. In the second half of the discussion, we would like uh, to have a dialogue uh, with you. Open the floor uh, to you, and we are ready to take your questions uh, in the second part uh, of the panel. I would like to introduce our panelists. To the far right, well, basically in the center, but this is where I'm sitting. The center is being redefined, but this is, of course, a relative uh, uh, definition. Our, uh, the president of the Swiss Confederation is with us. We're particularly proud of the fact that he's with us tonight. He's also our foreign minister. Didier Burkhalter. He feels that Switzerland uh, uh, should uh, actually assume the role of uh, building bridges. And as he is a terribly busy man, uh, the President of the Confederation has uh, to leave us uh, at 8 o'clock, which is why we will direct, uh, or I will ask you to direct the first questions you have uh, to the President. Uh, uh, so that he will be able to answer them before he has to leave us. Next to him is Mr. Hohlmeister, Chief Executive uh, Officer of Swiss International Airlines. About Switzerland, uh, he says, here we really have a lot, of, a lot of red tape, more than in Germany. Of course, we don't believe that, uh, but I'm sure that he will explain what he means or what he meant and if possible, if necessary, is going to prove it. All the way to the left, Jean-Claude Bider. He's chairman of the board of Hublot, Switzerland. And if you've been reading the newspapers uh, with some attention, you will uh, have found that this week he was entrusted with an additional task. He has become uh, the uh, leader of uh, the uh, watch production of uh, the uh, large group LVMH. We would like to congrat congratulate him. Mr. Bieber, of course, has a number of things to say about Switzerland as well. Here's what he said. In Switzerland, we have to learn how to be proud of what we've achieved. To his right, there's Felix Irat. He's uh, head of the legal department uh, at Novartis, and he is a member of the, the board as well. In a portrait describing him, uh, he was called a pilot for difficult cases. So I'm sure that he's going to be able to comment uh, on where uh, Switzerland is supposed to go. You probably expected Mr. Jimenez uh, uh, instead of Mr. Herat, uh, but Mr. Herat will tell us why uh, this is not so. Yes, uh, I'm happy to do so. Mrs. Bayer, who's the moderator 
uh, was uh, very kind. Uh, she didn't call me a stopgap solution. Mr. Jimenez sent his best wishes, uh, but unfortunately, he uh, uh, was unable to come because uh, there was a change uh, in schedules, which is uh, quite usual uh, uh, during the, the World Economic Forum. So he's very sorry not to be able to be with us today. Well, and then we have Boris Collardi with us. He is chief executive officer of uh, Julius Baer, the bank Julius Baer. And I read the following comment about him. He became a banker because, and I quote, because I wanted to please my father. He thought that a banking career uh, would be a sure value in Switzerland. Can't do anything wrong there at the time. Herr Collardi. Mr. Collardi. Since the beginning of the banking crisis, how many thing, how many times did you think, why did I want to please my father? No, that's not really what I meant. I said it then, but I'm still very proud of the fact uh, that I am a banker today. Our industry, uh, the banking sector, is a very important uh, uh, part of activity of Switzerland, and we will hear this from our colleagues. The banking industry is an industry with a lot of links to the other branches uh, of uh, the economy. And for the last five, six years, we've been having a very difficult time. But before that, uh, uh, for the previous 15 years, we may have had it a bit too easy. So I think that we have to try really hard. We're doing it. We have to make great efforts in order to have a good and solid uh, financial industry. And then we will become an attractive place uh, for young students as well and graduates. Mr. Beaver, you know about crises and you know about crises in various uh, uh, branches of industries. Are you sorry for Mr. Collardi? No. No. <laughs> All the less because I'm, I agree with him. I'm entirely in agreement with him. We underestimate uh, the strength of Swiss banks, uh, first of all, uh, in terms of security. The security that is backed up by the state, uh, our legislation. In France, legislation changes every five years, uh, depending on uh, whether it's a left or right government. We have a security in uh, our country. We have uh, the safety and security uh, that comes with neutrality. The entire Swiss structure is very safe, and the Swiss bankers are extremely well organized. Uh, they offer great service. Just talk uh, and uh, work with other banks. Uh, you will soon find that Swiss banks are indeed very well organized. Swiss banks have 100 years of experience. It's a real trade. If I think that uh, thanks to the Federal Council, we uh, start uh, to uh, have activities with Chinese. Uh, once the Chinese come to Switzerland, then they actually choose Switzerland for the Rubimbi. Well, I'm dreaming, of course. Then you'll see what Switzerland is all about. Uh, uh, the Chinese don't want to go to Wall Street. They don't want to go to Great Britain. We have a great chances there. Ten years from now, we will say, why uh, were we so pessimist? I am not one bit sorry for Mr. Collardi. I'm not sorry for him either. Mr. Buchhalter. Mr. President. Do you share Mr. Beaver's enthusiasm for Switzerland? Well, it's not even a dream. Uh, we are discussing uh, this matter quite seriously, the center for the Rumumbi. But I would like to say two things. First of all, there are a lot of young people who want to be bankers, who want to work as bankers. It's a new generation. And it is very important to, to uh, hear that there is a future in the banking trade. We had a lot of criticism, but uh, the banking sector, although it went through a rough patch, is still there. I wouldn't really say 
adapted, but it actually decided to, to move and to change, not in order to adapt to others necessarily, but to come up with new business models and to have a new generation, a generation of young people who wants to be active in the sector, which is good. Second, the institutions. When I read uh, uh, what I'm supposed to discuss here, that everything uh, will change because it's the, the banking secrecy no longer exists, uh, uh, I want to remind you of the fact that the institutions in Switzerland are very strong. If you think of what uh, Switzerland's been through and what it lived through during the last few years, uh, it is still going strong. Not everybody is well, but I must say that uh, our institutions are very strong, so I'm very optimistic, uh, not only for our economy, but for our people. What are Switzerland's particular strengths? Well, this is what I mean. Just read the Constitution. It'd be a good thing to read the Constitution once in a while. Maybe a light version of the Constitution. Switzerland is uh, a space uh, for peace, for respect, for dialogue, uh, for in uh, innovation uh, and trade. Now, uh, what uh, you're supposed to aim for is uh, well-being, uh, welfare, um, peace, stability. So in other words, uh, you always want to make sure that uh, there are human rights uh, that are respected, uh, that there is democracy, uh, that uh, there is environmental protection, and that you combat poverty. The nicest thing about the, this constitution is uh, that we are able, we will be able to reach our goals uh, by promoting our values, which is wonderful. That's fantastic. That's Switzerland. Of course, banking secrecy uh, is very important, uh, but the real discussion doesn't really turn around the banking secrecy, but rather how we will be able to uh, protect our private lives, uh, not only in the banking sphere. It is not that important uh, to protect information uh, about something that might be uh, dishonest or uh, that is not nice. Uh, you don't really have to uh, protect information concerning these matters. But uh, our private lives, uh, yes, uh, data protection, that is important. Not everybody is supposed to know everything about everybody. You can always read it up in the Constitution. It's all there. Mr. Hohmeister nods. Uh, He's nodding. Did he read? Did you read the Constitution? Yes, indeed. That's one of the first things uh, that I did when I came to Switzerland, um, because uh, I uh, am very interested in history. So uh, uh, every country has its idiosyncrasies, which is why I went straight to the Constitution. I still have my Constitution uh, back home in the kitchen. When you didn't deal with red tape. Well, there you quote me, and I uh, said that uh, a few years ago. Uh, when I came to Switzerland, uh, I wanted to, to get, uh, uh, with an L permit, I wanted to, to get a phone line or to want to have a, a mobile phone or uh, to uh, get a license plate for my car. I must say it was a real challenge. I would say that uh, that uh, Switzerland could become slightly more European there, but uh, I really don't want to go into details. These were my first impressions. Uh, it's easier in Germany if you uh, come there from Spain and bring your car. Uh, it's far easier. In Switzerland, it was a bit more complicated. But basically, that was a uh, post-immigration comment that I made uh, so far. I can deal with red tape in Switzerland quite well. I don't get entangled. Were well, you not over-adapted yet? Well, basically, I am not a person who adapts uh, very well. Ask my parents, uh, uh, my family, uh, uh, my friends. Uh, assimilated, yes, but adapted to truly integrated, maybe not. Maybe this is why. Uh, one of your quotes is, I'm not typically German. That's what I say. I don't know what others say about me. Very subjective. 
I don't think I'm a typical German because uh, I am not really uh, into hierarchy. Very early in life, I learned that hierarchy is less important than competency. So I'm really more interested in being competent, and I'm not uh, particularly uh, uh, in favor of a regulation. Uh, uh, it's nice to know your regulations by heart, but basically, uh, my uh, basic regulations are something I don't know by heart. It is uh, more important for me to uh, do the right thing. Uh, to be right is all right, but you can be right and do the wrong thing. I think I'm just different. I uh, went to all kinds of countries. I went to, to uh, Italy, uh, Spain, uh, Great Britain. There, uh, I must say that we I've learned a lot about historical reality. So basically, uh, you uh, fit in then more easily. What would you say? How do the typical uh, How does the typical German differ from uh, the typical Swiss person? Well, if you uh, were to ask me what a typical German per how a typical German is different from a typical Tunisian, it would be easier. But uh, Switzerland and Germany, these two cultures and civilizations are very close to each other. Well, I must say we speak different languages, of course, because uh, no in northern Germany, of course, you speak a German that is quite different from Swiss German. We uh, have basically the Constitution is a good example because we have very similar values. Uh, in Germany, the Constitution is called a basic law. The first 10 articles uh, don't follow the same uh, sequence, but basically uh, they contain the same thing as uh, uh, the ones in Switzerland. Uh, in uh, Germany, human rights are in the first position, and here it is uh, freedom. Each and every Swiss person claims his own freedom, which is number one in the Constitution as well. And I would say uh, the fact that they want to be liberal, they want to be free, and they want to define their own freedom, this is uh, one point that uh, basically distinguishes uh, a German person from the Germans uh, who are more, uh, who fit more easily into hierarchy. Mr. Hirat, are you a typical Swiss person? I must say I have a hard time defining the typical Swiss person, which is why I am unable to answer this question properly. I would say that uh, what uh, links us uh, between uh, Geneva, Cour, Chefus, and Chiasso are values. Uh, we have a feeling of belonging together, and we are aware of the fact that we are Swiss. We know that we can fight uh, quite seriously, whether we uh, have uh, uh, votes, uh, uh, we have very diverse uh, results in the various cantons, but basically there is a feeling that is hard to describe, but we have the feeling that we're all Swiss, which is a very strong aspect, uh, which is why I'm unable to answer your question. I might uh, give you an approximation. I have uh, a uh, I am working in a very international group, but uh, at the same time, it's a very typically Swiss uh, uh, group. We have uh, 11 to 12 percent uh, Swiss staff. Although we uh, only uh, have a 1 percent of our turnover in Switzerland, in Switzerland, uh, more than 100 uh, nationalities uh, are prevalent uh, among staff. At the same time, it is a typically Swiss group, uh, w which is very deeply anchored in Switzerland. And I think uh, that it is uh, uh, the uh, fact that you're Swiss, uh, that you have uh, roots in Switzerland, uh, that you are s that you stand for values. But at the same time, uh, you uh, go elsewhere, you are successful, and then come back. This is typically Swiss. Mr. Beaver, he uh, described a typical Swiss person as such. Uh, Swiss, uh, the Swiss people are uh, faithful, honest, and diligent. Yes, you feel that when you work in Switzerland. Uh, uh, the Swiss people can be trusted. They're reliable, and they are diligent. They're hard workers, and they're honest. But basically, uh, you have uh, of people with values. 
the Swiss are incredibly creative. We always forget that. Swiss are very, very creative. We have a lot of cultures and a lot of religions, but we are all creative. These are values uh, that were very uh, important for our machine industry. Uh, for That's what uh, created our watch industry, banking industry, pharmaceutical industry. We inherited our mentality from the Swiss mentality, which is then uh, what allowed us uh, to be active in various spheres and in various uh, activities. I really believe in it. The definition uh, to, to define a Swiss person is practically impossible. There is no such thing as a Swiss person as such. So look at uh, the uh, canton of Valle. There are two or three different languages spoken. Uh, uh, some people live on top of the mountains, some live down in the valleys. So you can't really define it. The only thing you can define, well, I'm a patriot. I can define myself as a patriot. Uh, I want to defend my country. And every time I come to the United States, uh, I go uh, to, uh, uh, I get to the airport. I'm not uh, through passport control yet. I've seen the American flag eight times. When I get to Switzerland, there's no such thing as a Swiss flag. I have to go up to Zermatt, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, there is a small chalet, and then you finally find a Swiss flag. We have to learn uh, to be more proud of our country. We have to become better patriots, and that can't do any harm. But who would you like to defend Switzerland against? Against whom? Against the Swiss. The greatest danger is within the country. We have to try to defend uh, our own system uh, from the inside, because we're really spoiled. I'm not really afraid uh, of uh, foreign countries. Uh, other countries respect us, uh, admire us, and copy us. I went to Harvard Business School in November in order to talk about the Swiss model, to explain to the Americans that this model is more topical than anything else. The, the whole world can learn from us today, and you have to understand that. Not only learn about democracy, but learn about the dual training system. Learn how we integrate foreigners and how we uh, take in foreigners in Switzerland. Uh, and if you listen to Novantes, uh, a hundred different nationalities are active among their staff in uh, Basel. That is incredible. I would say that the Swiss have to become more patriotic. Uh, they have to actually analyze their own values in order to attempt to carry those values over to the 21st century. Mr. President, more patriotism, would that be a good thing in Switzerland? We are quite patriotic, but we don't say it. We don't admit it. We don't really have to uh, uh, exhibit it, uh, but sometimes uh, strength lies in uh, being self-confident uh, and to live with our patriotism. But luckily, there is no such thing as a typical Swiss. There is something which is typically Swiss, so we have respect for diversity. S Switzerland is a team. Team Switzerland. And there you can uh, define uh, some specific uh, Swiss values. But have a look at uh, the national football team. Are some of them more typically Swiss than others? Only those who actually uh, uh, are able to uh, come up with goals are Swiss and the others not? No, I don't think so. I liked what Mr. Beaver said, but one thing uh, I don't agree with. The Swiss person is creative. No, there are some Swiss who aren't creative at all, but they're still Swiss. There are 8 million Swiss. And all of them uh, are somehow integrated in a project, and we mustn't ever forget it. We always have a lot of arguments in Switzerland. 
But basically, one is happy here. You're quite right. We are happy in our country because we really only have to defend each other uh, and defend us against uh, each other. That's not bad. When we went to Montreux for the Syria conference, uh, we witnessed hatred, not throughout, but for some time. There are some regions in the world where there is so much insecurity, instability, no chance to know whether at the end of the day things will be all right or whether you will be alive or not. We don't have that in Switzerland. And that is typically Swiss. And what is even more typically Swiss is work. We're not the only ones in the world who work, but we like to work. In Switzerland, for instance, we give our guests gift. This year, we decided to give a gift to youth, and I asked the watch industry whether they were able to make a watch created only by young people and certify it. And they said yes, immediately. A few weeks later, it was done. Now we have a watch, a unique watch, which is only made by apprentices. That is something that wouldn't be possible in uh, the other country, that actually young people come up with something as nice as that without help from other Swiss. So we learned that uh, the Swiss are a hard-working people. Mr. Hohmeister, what about you? Well, I, of course, don't. I'm not hard-working. Well, of course, I'm joking. But I would like to get back to what Mr. Beaver said. Uh, Basically, I'm not entirely in agreement with him, but possibly I look at things uh, from the outside rather than from the inside. I do think that uh, the Swiss are quite nas and quite uh, uh, proud of uh, their nation. They're multicultural. Uh, they are very diverse. Uh, that's a good thing. They are proud of each other, but you don't necessarily say so. You don't uh, show it. It would be better that uh, if Switzerland uh, We're a bit more self-confident uh, towards the outside world, and uh, we have our foreign minister right here. It's not so much a matter of national identity. I think we have a very strong national identity, far stronger than in Germany. But uh, self-confidence is not entirely uh, as strong. What was your question? Well, basically, you answered that question. You do like to work, yes, once in a while. But about, uh, you did the comment on foreign policy as well. I would like to quote you. What? Uh, do the Germans do better than the Swiss, and you said they're better in foreign policy. Mr. Burkhalter, Mr. President, this is a comment for you. What well, doesn't matter if the Germans are very good. Fine. Good thing that uh, they uh, have good foreign policy in, in uh, Germany, but maybe they want to uh, say, sh you should say yourself uh, what you mean. Well, basically, I think that uh, the Germans are quite strong in uh, projecting their national image uh, uh, outside their own country. I would say that it would be desirable that uh, Switzerland would be a, should play a stronger role because uh, Switzerland can make uh, more of a contribution. The value system, which would be a good thing for Europe, it would strengthen Europe. Uh, Mr. Beaver mentioned it, but of course we have to see it uh, in a greater context. Immerhin. <laughs> Well, it's already that. Herr <laughs> Collardi. <laughs> Mr. Collardi, what would you tell Mr. Hohmeister? We don't sell ourselves well, do you agree? Would I have the opportunity to live in uh, various countries? Uh, and to, to travel to various countries. And I would say uh, that uh, Switzerland uh, was always very good at selling herself. People have a far more positive view of Switzerland than we do. But it is true that uh, for the future in a globalized world, we could do more. I think we have to uh, find good 
alliances, uh, good partnerships with others. Possibly we should speak more loudly once in a while, which is not necessarily typical for us. But basically, one should say if one doesn't agree right away instead of compromising immediately. We uh, talked uh, about this uh, with uh, some colleagues. We could do more in the international scene. We don't do as much as Germany, but it would do as good. Well, Mr. Colardi, how should Switzerland change for the future? You said that you live in the future. Well, there you're quoting me uh, in a very specific discussion about the Financial Center Switzerland. Uh, and we have a lot of discussions with our Swiss colleagues uh, in Switzerland, uh, but really there are uh, two opinions that uh, there are some people who want to live in the future, like some uh, people who are there in the public. Uh, they say we should change the framework conditions, and then everything will be all right. And then there are other people who uh, uh, talk about uh, 1780, uh, 1820, 1915, and uh, 1970. They still talk about how good things were then, but really that's no use at all. We have to look forward. We have to trust our values and our strengths, and we want to make sure that we remain as competitive in the future as we've been in the past. I was in various uh, financial centers in Asia and in other European financial centers, and I can only repeat what my colleagues have said here before. There is no other financial center in the world with such a high degree of competency as Switzerland, which is why the banking syncrasy will not no longer be relevant five years from now. It is much more uh, about confidentiality and data protection. And we have to uh, look, be forward-looking. Uh, we can't say that nothing will work any longer. We, it's not true. It will work. Well, how can you make people change? That's quite simple. You have to speak to be honest with people. We have to describe the future to them with the data we have at hand today. We will uh, tell them how we will manage things and then let them participate in designing the roadmap. Uh, we have a lot of creative and uh, people who are into innovation. Others, again, wait for orders. But I think we can be an inspiration to people. We can define our way forward with our people. This is what we've been doing for the last hundred years. Switzerland came under pressure time and again, and we were always able to find innovative solutions for the future, which is exactly what we have to do now. Mr. Erd, uh, you're breathing heavily. No, 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 really. Maybe just um, uh, to address a few points um, that were mentioned. My view is that Switzerland is the epitome of a country that is continuously dealing with the future. Why is that my view? If Switzerland's got something that it has um, cherished over the past few years and has made it what it is and will be in the future a special country, it's innovation. The ability to be innovative continuously. This is where we are not self-assured enough, internally speaking, in Switzerland. Two of um, uh, the largest companies in the world uh, living by innovation, it's Novartis and Roche, uh, in immediate vicinity, ABB, uh, shaping electricity transmission and supply throughout the world. Then we have hundreds of SMEs, not just the big companies, that not only survive, but thrive despite difficult market environments that expand 
both in Switzerland and abroad. I think that is a recipe for success, an asset, innovation. And what is innovation? Innovation is to predict the future or think what we need in the future. And I think we've got great abilities in this country. And I think uh, we should be a little bit more self-assured about this and accept it. And I do not really share the view that we are so timid when it comes to our stance in the world. I think this is an internal phenomenon. Of course, the Germans um, uh, have a better language facility. With German, the, the Italians are more creative. And I don't know what you think about the French. Well, Mr. Beaver certainly has an opinion about the French. What about the French? Well, I work for a French group, LVMH. It's the largest luxury corporation, luxury goods. So um, they're quite good as well. We have 37% um, of uh, French workers crossing the border every day in the watchmaking industry. So we definitely need the French, whether we need the French politics and uh, the behavior of the French, well, uh, behavior of the French politicians, I don't know. Well, having said that, I live across the border from France. I see France every day. I look across the border. And I um, am really surprised that um, we think differently on uh, this side of um, uh, the border, that we uh, are happy with four weeks of vacation only instead of six, and that we work for 40 hours a week, not 34, five hours like the French. The French mindset. Uh, doesn't cross um, uh, the um, lake. We have a um, border, a true border here. That mindset doesn't cross the lake. We'll be happy to take uh, questions from uh, French participants, of course, in the audience later on. Mr. President, you want to have my view? No. Now, what's your view? You speak about change for Switzerland. How do you see this change? What would you wish this change to be like? I don't think we need to change a great deal. We don't need a revolution. But where we could do better, in particular in this era of major challenges for the whole planet, it's to prepare politics for next generation. Be less selfish. Think about the future generation. So whenever a decision is made in Switzerland, and we take decisions all the time in Switzerland, so that we think about the possible consequences for the future generations. And I think uh, we can do better here. Also among uh, the younger generation, the younger generation uh, should be given a responsibility early on so that they also think on behalf of the next few generations. That is difficult because we live in a fast-paced society. I'm not really uh, so happy um, about um, going to the ballot uh, on your computer, voting through computers. I think it takes a while, some time to think also on behalf of others, and I think one can do that well in our society in Switzerland because uh, we are a mature society. Why do we vote for four weeks of um, vacations only? My colleagues, um, uh, foreign ministers abroad, keep asking me, Didier, how do you make people uh, say no to more vacation? <laughs> now, if we took a vote, they say, uh, we would never get it through. Then I say, well, there are two reasons. First of all, the Swiss population is used to 
go uh, to the ballot box. It's not uh, once every 10 years. It's uh, really a regular thing. So it's a responsibility of every citizen. So everyone's held accountable and responsible. And we always work for jobs. Uh, thank God we have a little unemployment. But in Switzerland, we think about uh, the possible risks of the future. If we take a decision, will it mean that we are going to lose jobs? That's why we take such mature decisions, if I may say so. And I think this is something we have to preserve and also think in terms of the needs of the future generations. I think this is something all of us need, um, not just citizens, also the parties, the political parties. Well, we do have a representative of uh, the youth, Mr. Collardi. He's a young man. Well, uh, you were given a lot of responsibility at a young age. How did it feel? How does it feel? I don't think it's just a question of age. It's a question of uh, experience. Sometimes you are just faced with a situation and you have to grapple with it. I think uh, young people should be given opportunities in many industries. They uh, think in long-term perspectives. They take more risks. They not only think of the past, they also think of the future going forward. There's no proper age. I think it's a question of mindset. But being less selfish or not selfish at all, Mr. Homeister, should we delegate more uh, to uh, be successful to climb the ladder? Well, that's an interesting question. Should one delegate more to be successful? I think you have to share a lot of weight um, uh, to be successful. If you fight um, on your own only, then you're lost. Now, if you look at Mr. Collardi, you really have to be a team player. If you um, want to be successful, you have to delegate powers. You have to also delegate authority and responsibility. If you can't do that, you will never make it. You have to be able uh, to trust others, delegate others that uh, support you in your mission. You need uh, the team. You have to learn uh, to let go and uh, delegate and then also uh, define uh, the proper mission, the proper strategy and the objectives and also define them in a pluralistic way. Because if I say we'll go there, then uh, people uh, will not follow me automatically. You have to share your strategy with others. And I could uh, talk about further elements of leadership. Leadership only works if you can let go and delegate. Mr. Erat, you are a lawyer, general counsel of Novartis, and uh, you uh, come into play when things get tough and you have to think ahead. If you were asked to think ahead for Switzerland, where are the necessary changes uh, that Switzerland should embrace? Well, Switzerland has proven in its history that it can espouse change and uh, shape the country with changes. One topic here is the financial industry. I am absolutely convinced, just like uh, the other panelists that have addressed the point so far, that our financial industry will emerge stronger from this crisis and will continue to be a key player um, of our industry, of our economy with um, uh, the jobs and uh, its contribution to our general welfare and wealth. Now, where do we need to change? Well, I'm tempted to say that it's a change more of the same. If we stick to our traditional virtues, if we keep working hard and all the other things that Mr. Beaver mentioned, and if we uh, remain open towards new things, and that is difficult to strike a balance here, 
continue to be proud of our roots. Um, and our roots are not necessarily Switzerland, but Schaffhausen, my hometown, or uh, Neon, Porontry, or Lucerne, or wherever you come from. We are always locally anchored. That's where we are at home. But at the same time, we should open ourselves. If we manage to do that in the future as well, then I'm not really worried about uh, what is going to happen in the future, about the need for change. I'm really optimistic and confident. Mr. Biver, but how do you succeed to be permanently innovative? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a mental thing. It's a mindset. It's uh, really something that happens in your mind. And to be innovative means to be alive. When you're alive, you've got to reinvent yourself every day, every morning. And we are a small country. We've got advantages and disadvantages. And think back 40 years ago, I started to work in the watchmaking industry. One dollar was at four francs fifty. Now one dollar is just 90 cents. And the um, engineering industry uh, did grow despite this uh, exchange rate effect, uh, thanks to the creativity and hard work. I'm not talking about the luxury industry, about the watchmaking industry. We've made it as well, despite the difficult circumstances. And that's typical for the Swiss. We may be innovative or creative because we were born that way. Uh, we uh, really had to struggle hard because Switzerland doesn't really exist. Switzerland is the world. The Swiss have learned that the Swiss territory is the world. The Americans say, America is my country. He's right, 220 million uh, people. Novartis is uh, just has 1% of its sales in Switzerland. We generate 4% of our total sales in Switzerland. So we've learned from the very beginning to fight and struggle abroad, to go abroad. And you can only win if you are bold, if you are courageous, creative, and hardworking. And we've uh, succeeded in doing that for the past 150 years. It is in our lifeblood. It's in our DNA. Now, if you continue to look further into the future, do you see industries where Switzerland um, uh, has a special potential where we should invest it more? Well, uh, let me talk about a dream. We once built the gutter tunnel, the tunnel through the gutter. That was a world project. And then uh, we built the dams, you know, for the reservoirs. These are world-scale projects. And now we have the great luck that the uh, economy has developed uh, more quickly than the structures. That's really fortunate. Now, if our structure would move ahead of the economy, then everything would be half empty. We would have unemployment. The economy is growing more quickly than the infrastructure. So what I think we should have is a big Swiss infrastructure investment. Just like uh, the Gotthard Tunnel or the um, big dams of the reservoirs in the past. But that's just a dream, you know, that's, I'm just thinking aloud, it's idealism. But sometimes such ideas will get you further. Well, we're building such a big project. Well, uh, there's been one before. It's a second tunnel, yes, okay. Uh, but the first time around, it was uh, more difficult. He said, we should be proud. And we're building the longest tunnel of the world. I think we should be proud of this, about the second gutter tunnel for the railway. Well, um, the president of the Confederation has uh, to leave earlier to build bridges. Yes, he says. I think we can take the first few questions uh, from the audience. Please address them to um, our president. And wait for the microphone, please. 
Let's begin uh, with uh, the gentleman here on the side. Uh, would you please identify yourself and be brief? Clemens Bully DeFos. Uh, President, you spoke about um, non-selfish um, motivations of the youth. And in your opening statement, you spoke about the humanitarian mission of Switzerland. Now, uh, Switzerland exports um, weapons um, uh, to countries such as Saudi Arabia and Pakistan with a desolate humanitarian situation. To what extent is this uh, compatible with altruism and uh, the humanitarian constitutional article? Well, it is compatible because the law is quite clear and uh, the electorate has voted on it. But if you do not agree, then we can vote a second time around. You are free to express your opinion. Uh, there is a, a law. I mean, laws don't change all that quickly in Switzerland. But uh, this is a decision taken by the electorate. And what we do is uh, what is in compliance, in full compliance with our law. Yes, please. Uh, Mr. President, I have a question to you as well, because you have to leave early. One of your um, predecessors, Dolph Ogi, said the open forum is just a um, fig leaf um, and a um, distraction maneuver. And uh, we spoke about the banking secrecy and um, the innovation. And you distinguish between um, tax secrecy and uh, tax fraud. We have uh, Mr. Gulati here. Um, uh, that is something that wasn't discussed. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed. Of course, I'm proud of uh, many things. But if you say it's wonderful uh, to um, have a agreement with China, and you say that um, uh, humanitarian um, causes are of importance, then um, I'm not really proud. Then I feel sad. I don't know how you feel about this. But then. There's uh, Sergio Amotti, he works for UBS, but he was saved by um, uh, the, the government. Uh, before he was elected to be um, CEO of Switzerland, he said Switzerland became rich uh, through untaxed money. What do you think about that? I don't really know what the exact question is, but nevertheless, uh, banking secrecy is not really something negative. It's a way uh, to um, find a solution between uh, the citizen and uh, the state. And you've got to explain this to uh, people abroad, uh, because there are few countries where people fill in their uh, tax returns um, themselves. And uh, there's a certain honesty in Switzerland. This is why we've got this system. The system is based on honesty. And we've got to explain it to people abroad. And I think we should preserve it. What about human rights in China? Well, for the federal government, and I think it's shared by a large uh, part of the population, is that we do everything to uh, promote human rights. And I don't think we can improve things by just uh, saying, well, we are better than um, others, and we do not want to have any agreement with a country because uh, they think differently than we do. We have to go closer to others, approach them, and maybe um, s take a few steps back from um, our ethical stance and uh, try to improve things together with the Chinese. We have embarked upon a human rights dialogue with the Chinese. It's sometimes difficult. But because of our free trade agreement with China, the human rights dialogue was intensified again. And uh, you see that things are changing in China. Whether this is going to be confirmed in the future, I don't know. But things are changing and moving quickly in the world. As far as um, death penalty is concerned, 
Now look around the world. In many countries, they still they still have a death penalty. But we want to discuss things um, with the countries. But we should approach them. I think it's no contradiction to have such agreements and then improve human rights at the same time. We can achieve that. If you say, um, well, we want everything uh, from the very start, then we will have no contacts anymore, no agreements anymore, then uh, there will be isolation. We should keep up the dialogue. We should uh, stay close. We are pragmatic. That's true. Uh, we'd rather have a small step than no step at all. Uh, President will have to leave us shortly. He has to leave in seven minutes. Now, there's a present for the president. So there's no microphone. Apparently, it's a flower and chocolate inside. So let's be brief. We can have two more questions to our president. Gentlemen here in the light sweater. I'm Jakob Bukati. I am a high school student. I'm a Swiss citizen. He said that um, the young generation will be important in the future. My question to you as a president and foreign minister. Now, how uh, do you want uh, to um, uh, defend Switzerland against um, uh, data theft and uh, from Germany um, or um, the Americans uh, with NSA? That's a big problem. Well, um, I've done it today. We've discussed it this directly with uh, John Kerry, uh, the American um, Foreign Secretary. There's an international debate about it uh, this year. It's going to be a big debate. It's a debate about um, uh, the right to secrecy and privacy and um, uh, the challenges of new technologies. It will not only affect Switzerland, it will affect all of us. And that is uh, the good thing about the NSA affair, because uh, we didn't really believe that this would be possible. And now you see what can happen in this society if you don't discuss it together. And we've uh, launched an initiative in uh, the UN because there's no other way uh, to discuss uh, this uh, at a global scale. We've um, asked for a debate about um, uh, the uh, civil rights concerning um, secrecy in the UN. So protection of um, privacy and uh, secrecy for the individual. and. Um, the uh, article was created in uh, the 80s. Uh, a lot of things have changed. Uh, a lot of good things have happened, but a lot of dangers have emerged. And we've got to revise this. We've got to review it. And then there will be bilateral discussions with uh, Germany and uh, the United States. We are having these discussions. But the most important thing is, will we be able to preserve our privacy? Uh, will we continue to exist uh, without being totally transparent and people knowing everything about us who shouldn't? That is really a big debate that is only just started. Maybe the final question to um, the president. Yes, please. Rana Kissinger from Germany, but I uh, spend a lot of my time in Switzerland. Mr. President, uh, about the future of Switzerland, you say that you have to think in terms of uh, different generations. Do you think it is impossible um, uh, for uh, one of your um, uh, successors to be sitting next to Mrs. Merkel in the Council of the European Union, or would it be desirable? I think there was a second question. Maybe you can uh, um, ask it now. Well, you said um, every uh, Swiss is integrated in a project. All, this, all Swiss citizens are part of a project. The question is, what are the goals of that project and 
what is the joint project vision. Now, first of all, your questions concerning the EU. I don't think that Switzerland wants to join the EU. I think that's clear. We want to have a good, strong relationship with the EU, but we don't want to be an EU member. And this um, strong relationship with the EU is possible. We have solutions for that. And we have to um, be able to um, be in the driver's seat um, to take decisions. But we also have to accept that if we want to go along with uh, the EU, then uh, we have to uh, be responsible for uh, its consequences. But deciding by ourselves, that is what counts. And the project is Switzerland, the world, and responsibility. Switzerland can do a lot uh, for Switzerland and for the world. That's good for us because without the world, there is no Switzerland. That is an important project for everybody because all Swiss citizens can identify themselves with a country that works towards peace, human rights, democracy against poverty, poverty and for the environment. We will never be perfect. There will be contradictions. We are by no means perfect. And we have to go for a compromise. Just one thing about that. We accept compromises, but thank God, because in the world, there's so many countries and regions that are democratic, but those who win take it all. The winner takes it all, and those who lose will go to war. That is uh, what happens in a lot of uh, so-called democratic countries, for example, in Africa. We have a culture of compromise. Sometimes we do it too lightly, but it's also a project for the youth. It's not just for the youth, but what we should achieve is to build something for the youth, for those who come after us, future generations. And I think that is filling us with enthusiasm. And it is motivating. And so everyone has a value, every single person. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, this wonderful evening is far from over. Are there any further questions to the remainder of the panel members? I'd very much like to see a woman put a question. Are there no women in the room who would like to put a question? I would have liked to put the question to the president, but someone else can answer it. He's just come back from Geneva and Montreux, and the question was put, what can Switzerland do more than just lifting the banking secrecy? That's perhaps one of the problems because the banks uh, have traded with weapons and drugs. So he's just come back from Montreux. Switzerland has this possibility of bringing people together in this free zone and to promote tolerance. And Switzerland is also one of the pioneers in solar energy. There have been too many wars that circle and focus on oil. Isn't Switzerland in the position to do something about bringing us closer to solar energy and away from oil as a source of energy, since Switzerland has so much innovative energy and it could promote the rest of the world and push it, propel it towards more renewable energy and uh, self-sufficiency. Mr. Colardi, would you like to answer that? Yes, that's a very interesting question. Banks, like other industries, 
have certainly committed errors in the past, but I think many have learned from these past mistakes as a preliminary remark. Such a project would be possible in Switzerland. We have a good basic infrastructure. The country is quite small. The density is quite high in urban areas. If you think of Lugano, Geneva, Basel, Zurich, and it would be very easy to envisage such a project, an innovative energy project in Switzerland. I think there's enough willpower for such a project. The Swiss are very eager to save energy. I see it when I take the train from Geneva to Bern. You very often don't even find a seat. People love to take the train. So there are many possibilities, and the will is there in Switzerland, and the basic infrastructure is also there. Yes, the gentleman with the scarf, Mr. Royce. I am a project manager, and I'm also involved in a project on mobility as well as in an innovation park. So I have a question to you, Mr. Colardi. Would you be willing to help finance such a project in the preliminary stage? <laughs> Answer. For an organization like ours, this is very innovative and dynamic, uh, maybe a bit too much, but I'm not excluding the possibility. In Switzerland, there are so many banks and other many sources of financing, and I'm quite sure we'd find the necessary finance. So one could also consider a PPP, a private-public partnership, to finance such infrastructure projects. There are models of this kind in other countries. All those who speak in favor of liberalizing the energy market and electricity, the power market in Switzerland, would need projects that require long-term investment backed by the private sector or by a PPP with the necessary guarantees, especially in an environment where the interest rates are so low. So there is certain recognition for this possibility in Switzerland at present. And I'm sure one would find support, the necessary support from the banks. Absolute. Well, as Mr. Borkhalter has said, we have to think into the future and for very many generations also, if you want to have an appointment to meet with my bank. Thank you. That was very nice. Any other questions? Maybe people are not begging for money from Mr. Collardi, maybe he watches. I'm also a pupil from Zurich, and I have a question to Mr. Hohmeister, I'd love to be a pilot. That's my dream job. So I have a question about the future. Will there still be pilots in the future? The Boeing, Boeings now, the new Boeings don't even need pilots or hardly at all. So what's going to happen to this profession? What are the pilots going to do? Are they going to be hired by airline companies in Asia? Answer, well, that's, that question has already been answered for the next generation. We are already developing this next generation planes with Bombardier. It's a two-man cockpit or two-woman cockpit. So at Swiss, in any case, we will not have a great change in the number of pilots that we hire. We will continue to train pilots. Currently, we are training about 70 to 100 pilots every year, and you're certainly free to apply. So in the next four to five years, and we cannot see further into the future than that, we will need young people who want to join this job, which is a fantastic job. Of course, the profile will change just as the the train driver who no longer fills the steam engine with coal 
If you look at the high-speed trains in France and in Germany, the train driver has a completely different uh, responsibility and task than at the beginning of uh, the steam engine. So we'll have the same kind of change, and we already have had it, in aircraft flying. And we cannot forget that the air-to-ground adjustment and communication is becoming even more important important given the higher density of uh, air traffic. In the past, this used to be a pretty lonely job, but now it's going to become more and more a team job. Yes, the profile of pilots is changing, and I can tell you that anyone who applies for this job will have a very promising career. Well, what about careers at Novartis? Uh, aren't there any open slots there? Answer, yes, certainly. Certainly. Especially in this area, not only in this area. That concerns the future, as in air traffic. What's the future in medicines? Medication, how can we convert the fatal diseases into chronic diseases uh, to save lives in the long term? We need, we have a great need for people, for many people, for highly qualified, well trained people in Switzerland. Novartis has created a lot of new jobs in the recent past. This is a changing environment, but there has been a very considerable increase, so the answer is definitely yes. We need highly skilled, well-trained people, not Swiss nationals or foreigners. We need the best in each sector, all those who want to work towards reaching this fantastic objective of improving life for everyone. Mr. Beaver, you are a visionary. What would you recommend or advise, recommend to or advise young people who don't quite know what they want to become, what profession they want to opt for? What, what would you recommend to them? Into which sector should they move? Well, I can tell you that I don't like working. I really don't like working or work. And because I don't like work, I decided to find a job that is a passion. So when you are involved in a passion, you're not working. So my first advice would be to, first piece of advice to a young woman or man would be to look for a job or a profession that is your passion. And my five children all said, well, Dad, I have no passion. I have no great love. Well, that's normal. Mozart, Picasso, they had great passions, but they are exceptions. Normal people don't necessarily have a, pension, a passion. But if you're just an ordinary person, try and find a passion. And they ask me, well, how do I do that? Well, dear children, in French, we use the word inquisitiveness. You have to be curious about everything, inquisitive about everything. And this will lead you to all sorts of details. You'll ask yourself, why is this flower yellow? You will start investigating, and you'll suddenly discover wonderful things. And maybe it's biology that will be your passion. So you have to be inquisitive. You have to find out about new things look into new things. And if you don't have any of this, and my son didn't, I said, well, off to China. The whole family started screaming, can't send this young man to China. He's going to be killed, murdered there. And I said, this young man has to go to China, and he has to learn to write Chinese. So I sent him off to China for two years. For two years, he had to learn six hours a day until he was 
He'd acquired these 1,500 symbols and signs. Now he writes all his emails in Chinese, and he speaks Chinese, and everyone wants to employ him, and he has a job simply because he learned to speak Chinese. So I'm just trying to say that if you don't have a great love or a passion, learn languages or try and acquire a skill that is fairly um, rare. It was very rare 12 years ago to find a son who knew how, uh, to find a person who knew how to write and to read. That's what I tell young people. You don't have to be a genius, but it is, it is a good basis with, on which to build and work. So are there any passionate people in the hall? Yes, I'd like to put a question. Well, I'm a woman. I'm a retired woman. And I'd like to put a question to Mr. Collardi, because he's a banker. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the young and future generations with all this money that has been printed, that comes out of the printing press, but doesn't really exist? <laughs> well, that is an excellent question. All this money that has been printed will be taken out of circulation again in within a generation. Yes, the money was printed, it is in circulation, but over the next few generations it will gradually be taken out of circulation again. If the economy starts working well again worldwide, and there is some indication for this, in some regions it's already started and in others it's going to start, we will be able to take money out of circulation, the interest rates will rise again. Two years or one year ago this is still seemed to be an insurmountable problem, but in a few years' time this will be resolved. It's, you've taken lots of notes. I'd like to put a question to all of you. Uh, Switzerland is safe and secure, it's free, all this sounds wonderful. But the rate of suicide is very high, so what do you think about that? The, the French are perhaps a bit better off since they don't look at their watch all the time. They maybe are a little happier and therefore have a lower suicide rate. Who would like to say something about uh, happiness in general? Mr. Holmes, why me? I have my own theory about happiness. Someone who has to be made happy will never be happy. You can only be happy yourself, if I have inner peace, if I know that I've been honest vis-a-vis uh, -vis of myself, if I have my own dignity, only that will allow me to be happy. But many people are seeking something that doesn't exist. Their demands are too high, their requirements are too high, they have the wrong objectives or live in a virtual world. And that unfortunately is the case due to this increasing technology, all these influences, external influences without bearing the corollary, which is responsibility. So we are exposed to these influences, these factors of influence from the outside, and you cannot be happy. But I think you can only be happy if you seek for this happiness inside yourself and have the necessary peace and dignity. As Mr. Beaver said, I think if you can develop yourself in such a way as to be un unique, have unique interests and also are completely engaged and committed to such a unique interests and don't just sit there on their hands and wait until something happens. 
sometimes you need to become active in charity work or be a volunteer without being remunerated because that is something where you can do good for the community and assume responsibility for others. By doing so, you can become very happy. You don't have to necessarily be a manager or a CEO to be happy. I cannot prevent anyone from jumping off a bridge. I'm sorry if this is not the answer that you were expecting. Well, look at the weather between November and February. The, the hill I live on is not high enough, so I'm always stuck in the fog, and that can make you very depressive. I know this as a fact. If you have depression as part of your mental setup, then it, you are at risk. I don't know whether it, this is constitutional. If you take London or Berlin, where the metropolitan areas are much denser built up, maybe it's due to that. I'm seeing it from the point of view of the human being. Every individual can do very much to be happy. If everyone does, which has already been mentioned, that is, say, sharing with others, not only in material terms, one of my basic principles is to share, to delegate, share interests, share responsibilities. That makes me much more content than if I simply pay out money. Another 10 minutes, the lady with the orange scarf. I must say that the banks have become rather, have, have been have come away quite unscathed from the discussion this evening. There was a tremendous redistribution um, as a result of the banking crisis. And there was a redistribution that came from the bottom and went to the top, Mr. Collardi. I think we need to redistribute wealth also worldwide. Oxfam has published a figure. 85 persons worldwide own as much as half of the world population. And there must be something wrong, basically wrong, when this is correct. And I think you, the banks, Mr. Collardi, have a very important role to play. Depends on where you focus your investments on. In Germany, the Deutsche Bank participates and continues to participate in the armaments industry and speculation on foodstuffs in the agro-business. So uh, when can we conclude that it is simply not possible to make profits from absolutely anything and everything, Mr. Collardi. Well, history has not been fully written on this subject. I do agree with you entirely. Banks have indeed acted irresponsibly in very many sectors and speculated and generated a lot of money for the banks themselves and for some of their customers. But I must say, honestly, this is simply no longer possible due to the flood of new regulations. And the banks have to have a lot of capital in order to trade in certain areas. I hear from other colleagues in the banking sector that management now discusses rather whether something is ethical or not, rather whether it's legal or not. Tax money that has been used to rescue banks in the past years. Well, I recently read in a study that in most countries, this has been paid back with quite a big profit. 
this has been the case in Switzerland as well. Of course, it was a very stressful situation for the whole system, and the banks were certainly not prepared to go through such a stressful situation. Governments were forced to intervene, but on the whole, and in nearly everywhere, this problem has been rectified and all the new regulations have as a purpose to ensure that this no longer happens. If a bank assumes too much risk, then such a bank would no longer in the future be rescued by the taxpayer. And the last part of my answer would be as follows. Not only in the banking industry, but in the watch industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, CSR, corporate social responsibility, has evolved a lot. All I can say is that I recommend you read up how companies are committed to, to such responsibility. We, for example, have decided to commit ourselves to the training of young people, and this we do through a foundation. This is something that many banks and many companies will decide to make this one of their business priorities. Now, as to the redistribution worldwide, This cannot be a responsibility only for the banks. It's simply a matter also of opportunities not being distributed fairly. Maybe this is not so much the case in Switzerland, but in other countries, especially in the emerging markets, it's very clear that a very small percentage of the population owns more than 80% of wealth, and this will have to be adjusted in the long term. Well, we've only got five minutes left, and I want to give the opportunity to someone else to put a question. The gentleman here in the middle. Thank you. I'm Ben Ordung from Germany. We have four representatives from four different sectors, and we've heard that the future is quite promising. I'd like to ask you how you see your social responsibility and what kind of projects you intend to support in the years to come. Let me start, says Mr. Jimenez from Novartis. That's a very far off reaching question, and there's not just one answer. The corporate social responsibility, and I think we're all in favor of this, is in fact the following. You have to manage the company innovatively, make sure that the company can survive, that jobs are guaranteed to create new jobs. I think that is the basic responsibility of any, mark, any company, any going venture. You've heard from Mr. Collardi that there are other possibilities. Every company, or at least I believe that every single company uh, fixes its own focal points and objectives. I could tell you what our objectives are, our focus points, where we are active in Africa, what we do in other countries, where we give medication and medicines free of charge and where it has been confirmed, we have been able to save hundreds of thousands of lives, and we don't publicize this. But then there's the political debate. It's a very complicated debate, and the question is how much is enough or isn't, isn't there a need for more? That is the basic political debate that every company has to think about. It's a debate every company has to have, and Every company has to find an answer to this. That is to say, when you need to create new jobs, when you need to reorient your focal first, every company is an organic body. I know that we could go on discussing these questions, but time is nearly up. I'd like to ask Mr. Beaver to close this discussion. You are a supporter of Switzerland, a Swiss fan. 
perhaps you can give the participants a takeaway message, a take home message? Well, I believe that the Swiss can get up every morning and say to themselves, today is going to be a better day than yesterday. If I think of the Spaniards, young Spaniards, the young Portuguese, or anywhere in any other country, how can these young people even get up in the morning and say or maintain that today is going to be better than yesterday? It's not possible. The only thing they can say, I hope it's not going to be worse than yesterday. We have a lot of problems and poverty in Switzerland as well, but for the majority of the Swiss, it is true to be able to say that today is better than yesterday. And if that person is really young, he or she can say, day after tomorrow will be even better than today and yesterday. And that is a tremendous privilege when a whole country, a nation can say this, make this kind of statement in a world where there's so much injustice, so much misery, so much poverty. So we have to be grateful that we have this privilege. And since we are so grateful about it and for it, how, what can I do to return part of this privilege? Because this is something that has to be passed on. Otherwise, it will have been not have been beneficial, it would have been selfish. So what really counts for me is this optimism, to think optimistically. We, the Swiss, have the great fortune to be able to be optimistic and think optimistically. So I tell every Swiss person, make an effort and think this way. I'm wunderschönes that was a wonderful closing statement. Thank you very much. All that remains for me to do is to thank you for the debate, the discussion, for the participation. Thank the panelists, of course, very warmly for having taken the trouble to come to this uh, session. And maybe see you next year.